but luckily, my guest never sleeps. She never sleeps. She works all weekend. She doesn't do anything else. Uh, and I'm, 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 I'm lucky for me because she agreed to come on the program and, uh, and talk with us. And here she is, the one, the only, Sarah Montalbano from Ala Wait, there we go. Alaska Policy <laughs> Forum. Hello there, young lady. How are you doing this morning? I'm doing well, and I actually had some chance to relax this weekend. Did so. you really? Did, Did not you... work the whole time. <laughs> That's great. That's great. I watched way too much television this weekend. I, <laughs> Me too. I got I got onto a kick, and the next thing I know, I had consumed every episode of Star Trek: Strange Worlds, uh, the new, the new old prequel, whatever. I was like, "Oh, I'll watch this," and I was like, "Wow, that was how many episodes was that?" <laughs> Gotta go to bed. Uh, so anyway, it was just you know one of those things where you just kind of turn your mind to idle and just kind of you need that recharge a little bit sometimes. Where I'm not thinking about all the pains of the world. Um, all right, so we're ready to dive into this and uh, and talk a little bit about this. Uh, we've got the 175 million dollar one time increase coming. Uh, well, for right now, it could be more. Could be 200 million. Could be. I mean, who knows what they're going to dream up in the long run. But I had to laugh. I don't know if you were listening to the program here a few minutes ago talking about the Kenai City Council voting against this. Uh, they voted against a resolution to ask for more funding. And hmm. they cited two of the reasons that they said. Uh, they said, uh, uh, they said uh, opponents pointed out that every year there are dire predictions of funding shortfalls. So the sky is falling every year. Oh, it's going to be bad. And that the BSA increase comes with no accountability. And so they voted to postpone this resolution indefinitely. Uh, they basically killed it. And uh, I thought that was kind of interesting because you're, I mean, I remember being on the assembly and hearing similar thing. This is like nine years ago when I was on the borough assembly in Fairbanks that, oh, you know, if we just, if we don't get that state funding, we're just, it's going to collapse in on itself and we're going to, and of course, this is after we discovered that they had some emergency funds and things. We made them create a building maintenance facility fund because they were we got hundreds of millions of dollars in unfunded uh, deferred maintenance. And I'm like, but you're sitting on all these accounts. Why aren't we? So uh, anyway, it should be a um, it should be a, a real good discussion uh, for today, and I'm looking forward to it. So anyway, I hope you had a great weekend. Hope I did. Had, yeah. Good. Good. Anything good? What were you watching? I'm just curious. Oh, mostly uh, early seasons of King of the Hill, would you believe it? Uh, you know, I haven't watched that much, so. <laughs> Dang it, Bobby. Dang it. Yeah. Uh, all I'll right. tell you what. <laughs> I tell you what. <laughs> My kids watch that and they were just they quoting it to each other all the time. <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, all right, here we go. We're jumping back into it. The Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, liberty-based, free-thinking radio. Like and share, like and follow. Subscribe on YouTube. Do all the stuff that we're supposed to do. Let's get jiggy with it. I mean, that's not a real thing. But... Okay, welcome back to the program. It is the Michael Duke Show. It's Monday morning. Everybody's bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, right? Uh, we're ready to go and uh, and sit down and talk about some serious stuff. Education is in the mix, and uh, bringing us uh, up to speed on this is one of our favorite people talking about education, and that is Sarah Montalbano, who is the education policy analyst for the Alaska Policy Forum. That's a mouthful. We should just call her the education chick. I mean, that would be better. <laughs> Although, uh, is that sexist? I don't even know anymore. Uh, anyway, Sarah Montalbano joins us this morning to talk education. Uh, hello, my friend. Uh, how are you doing today? I'm doing quite well. How about yourself? You know, there's no complaints, no complaints. Um, so I asked you to come on the program to talk a little bit about a couple different things. Um, and uh, number one, I wanted to talk about this $175 million one-time piece of funding. Uh, some of the mechanics of it, you know, you know, what does it mean that it's not part of the formula and it's outside and everything, but also about the accountability aspect, which I know you and I have talked about in the past before, because that seems to be something that's uh, severely missing from a lot of the things that we talk about. And then the second 
second thing I want to talk about is this, um, where's the money? Uh, what I mean by that is we got a lot of COVID funds in the state, uh, hundreds of millions of dollars in COVID funds. And a lot of it went specifically to the schools because, well, the schools were all shut down, right? And they needed to do things like remote learning and all these other kind of stuff. And so there were millions and millions and millions of dollars that were pumped in there. And now I'm hearing about school districts that are sitting on pretty good sized reserves of money from COVID. Some apparently have spent it all some have not. Some are still sitting on uh, quite a golden goose egg. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that uh, as well. But let's get started on the increase. So um, $175 million, which I find it interesting that they break it down as a dollar figure. They say, well, it's a 600 and something dollar per BSA increase, but it's not inside the BSA, right? I mean, this is outside mm -hmm. of the base student allocation. This is a one-time funding because they don't want to be committed to it for the future. Am I, you know, wrap, you know, break this out for us here a little bit here. Give us, give us your thoughts on it as you look at it. That seems to be my understanding of it. I must be honest, I am not completely up to date on the news about this, but I did see that the uh, um, 175 million had uh, passed through uh, as being uh, discussed. One-time funding makes a lot of sense in some uh, areas. Uh, this, when we break it down into a per student BSA, we have to remember that all of these figures are fungible. So some student might get zero dollars of benefit and the others might get more. Uh, that's just an average uh, figure. So that that is the only thing I, I would really note about this. Um, is that this is, you know, a large sum of money, but it makes us have this conversation again next year, uh, which may or may not be a good thing, depending uh, on how you think about it. Uh, but it does make us have these these conversations, um, and it it requires us to think about fiscal uh, sustainability again, uh, instead of because we've we've done these one time increases before uh, that. You know, all of these different things. I think last time I was on your program, we discussed all of the things that pile on on top of the formula. And those are significant and shouldn't be ignored. So if this is one uh, way to think about this um, increase in funding, then this is perhaps something to consider. Well, I mean, because, again, that's part of the problem, um, you know, is that uh, we're already looking at it, it's not just although many Alaskans probably who aren't as well versed in what's happening will read the newspaper and go, oh, of course, we need to fund education that this must be in their mind. The BSA must be the only funding that the kids are getting instead of. Mm -hmm it's just a factor and it's not just a per pupil. There's also multipliers. There's also this, there's also that. I keep going back to the whole Anchorage school district getting funding for 70,000 plus kids when they only have 44,000 kind of thing. Um, but the, uh, the bottom line here is that this is one time because they can't decide on a new formula. They can't, they haven't been able to bring it out. Uh, even though many people have said, this is what we need to do. We need to break out, we need to break down the formulas and take a look at them. We need to see where the money's going inside the formula. Is it going into the classroom or is it going towards administrative and overhead costs? And what are the, you know, what is the overall per pupil cost in the long run? And you've had a lot of articles out recently talking about all of those different factors showing that uh, just because you give a dollar to education doesn't mean that it actually is going to the ultimate in-classroom teaching of the student. Absolutely. And that's one of the things we discussed last time as well. There are these multipliers to the formula that increase the BSA. There are so many things on top of the school funding formula as well. And what we have seen is that increases in funding historically have not improved outcomes. Since 2003, we've lost almost a year on the National Assessment of Educational Progress. Um, we need to think about the way these incentives are lining up in the school funding formula. Are they incentivizing teachers to do the best work that helps students in the classroom? Um, and you know, having this conversation this year, next year, it can be a long process, but it's one worth having. And of course, uh, you know, one of the things that we saw is that that became this became a major 
campaign issue in this last go around is that the school funding, we could see the handwriting on the wall was going to be one of the things that was just, uh, you know, ultimately important. And we were talking about increases in the $1,300 per student range for the BSA. This does not hit into that. This is only about 600 and change uh, uh, along the lines, but it is, uh, it's a, it's still a significant amount of money. And again, there is no, um, there is no linkage with the assessment or the outcome of the students. And as you point out, our, our educational, our scholastic achievement continues to decline, even though, I mean, we spend what, we are one of the highest states, right? On a per student spend for that. Yes, we are. And the census puts us in 2020 at $18,313 per student. I've cited that a lot. You can probably tell. Uh, but that is before, you know, COVID relief funds and things like that. And I know we'll be talking about that, too. But that is also millions of dollars the districts are sitting on and may not be using wisely. And, uh, you know, accordingly, you would think that more money equals better outcomes. But that is the assumption. <laughs> that's not only the assumption, that is the battle cry from those who are advocating for more education spending. If only we had more money, we could do better. But at the same time, not including any kind of, like I said, linkage between achievement, scholastic achievement and the thing um, is, is, I think, is a huge mistake. Now, other states have started to do that. They have started to put those... Um, They've started to put that linkage in to say you receive, you know, X amount until you hit certain milestones and then you receive more. And that is some of the newer things that we're seeing across the country. This is not uniquely an Alaskan issue, I think, but we're starting to see this across the country now. Yes, we are. And one of the things I like, Tennessee has a particularly interesting school funding formula. And what they've done is they've created an outcomes-based bonus to these formulas. So you get a certain amount per student. Uh, that is proficient in third grade English language arts, uh, things like that, that are, you know, really crucial for later grades, uh, eighth grade math, you're going into high school math, uh, calculus, things like that. Are you prepared? Uh, so they are able to incentivize outcomes without penalizing any districts that have poor outcomes, because you can imagine if you're taking away funding from schools that aren't doing well, uh, that's, that's obviously not a good thing. But having that financial incentive really does make districts perform better and they've seen good results from that. Uh, Florida as well incentivizes uh, sc passing scores on the advanced placement AP exams, uh, and they have the second highest rate of AP pass uh, in, in the nation. So these are just a few examples of how outcomes uh, can be incentivized in these formulas. As an analyst, uh, especially, I mean, I know probably numbers are one of your favorite things. Um, but uh, w when you see this and you see some of the resistance uh, from folks who just say, well, you can't put a number on success or you can't. I mean, you hear some crazy stuff when people talk about mm -hmm. this. Uh, and, you know, of course, the moniker of if you're asking for some kind of uh, if you're for some kind of accountability, some kind of linkage that you just don't want to fund children, right? I mean, this is the this is the immediate need. You're, well, you just don't like education then. That's not what I said. I said we want to get, mo you know, we want to get good results for our money. I'm not saying we shouldn't fund it. I'm saying we should get, re but this is kind of the reaction. Uh, what What are your thoughts as you look as, as kind of a numbers person? What do you think when you look at that and see those kind of arguments? It's interesting you asked me that. I think that there are so many ways in which schools are built to serve the interests of the adults in the building. Children need to be the focus of this. And I think the one thing we can all agree on is that we want our ch children to be as prepared as possible for this world that they are about to go into once they've graduated. Um, and it, it seems to me that it is almost stating the obvious. Well, of course I care about children. I would not be in this field if I did not care about getting these things. My issue is that uh, we're not delivering. We are not actually creating these outcomes for students. And there's a certain point where more money isn't going to help until we change our approach, until we focus this funding to actually get the outcomes we're looking for. Because af after a certain point, uh, you know, we're by some rankings, we're sixth in the nation for our per people funding. Um, you know, we are always up there. We are always at the bottom of the NAEP rankings. 
Uh, so I see such an obvious problem here uh, that we have tried to increase money before and it has not worked. So we need to be thinking innovatively about how to make these increases pay off for students. I'm reminded of Einstein's old quote, you know, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over. And that <laughs> seems to be what we're asked, not changing the way we're doing things, not changing mm -hmm. the methodology, but just saying, you know, it's throughput. If we just put more through, it'll be better in the end. You know, if we just put more money into it, it'll be better in the end. And that, unfortunately, is not, I mean, it's just not the case. I mean, it is the definition of insanity. And there are many other ways that you and I have talked about to try and uh, make that money go further. And whether that's a decrease in overhead and administrative costs, uh, we've talked about the consolidation of, you know, many different, we get all these different school districts, all with duplicative efforts of administrators and overheads and secretaries and vice, you know, whatever, and administrate all that stuff um, or, or anything else. And yet none of those things seem to be an attractive option for most of these people. And I think it goes back to what you just said, that this is built to serve the adults in the room rather than necessarily focusing on the kids. Absolutely. And I, I, I really have high hopes because this pandemic jolted a lot of parents out of just the acceptance of public schools as the default and as the best way to educate their kids. And I, I really do have high hopes that we see more innovative education solutions because students need these options now. Uh, they cannot afford to wait until some nebulous time when this funding has kicked in and now our public schools are all better because we've gotten more money. Um, I, it is not to say that funding couldn't be increased and could be made to do well. Uh, but like you said, we need to be thinking about accountability for outcomes, too. Uh, that we cannot have these in conversations about spending without thinking about the outcomes that they are getting us. No, I mean, that's that's no business would do that. Quality of product Absolutely. Would, be, would be paramount at the end, uh, even as you talk about investment and, and return and all that kind of stuff. But the quality of the product must remain paramount. Otherwise, I guess this is what happens when you have a, a monopoly uh, on everything. And this that's what this is, is this is a state run monopoly on education um, with dollars that are taken from us. And, you know, we've got to we've got to let our voice be heard on this. Sarah Montalbano is our guest. Uh, we're going to continue here in just a moment. And we're going to talk with her not only about the COVID funds uh, that are at the various schools, but also the uh, Alaska Policy Forum has got a big event this week. So we wanted to give her a chance to talk about that as well. So we're going to continue in just a moment. Sarah Montalbano, our guest, The Michael Duke Show. Common Sense, Liberty Based, Free Thinking Radio. Back with more after this. Listened to by more staffers in Juno than any other show because their bosses told them to. And after what they just heard, oh man, they're going to be pissed. You're a bad, bad man. The Michael Duke Show. You can smile. It's fine. <laughs> I'm doing well. I was looking I at this Reason article that someone linked. Oh, yeah. It's very no. interesting. Yeah, uh, Reason has been doing a lot of good work recently on uh, some of the education things. Um, and uh, I don't know who writes this one, but uh, uh, I know Corey DeAngelis, we've had him on the program several times talking about this since the pandemic began. And uh, they've got a real good handle, I think, on a lot of the things that are going on uh, uh, as well over there. Uh, I mean, this is frustrating uh, for those of us who've been arguing for it, like I said, because anytime we start talking about, um, OK, we'll 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 consider your education increase. But we also want to look at, you know, maybe getting a little bit better of a deal on it. And they're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Why do you hate children? That was <laughs> not what I said. You know, that was not what I said. But that seems to be the the case now. You're, um, you know, you're, you're a lot closer to your school years than I am. Right. Um, <laughs> and so when you look back at this and you say things like, it seems like they're focusing 
on uh, the needs of the adults versus the needs of the kids. Um, I mean, you've seen some of this and you've you've you dove down into some of the numbers on this and talked about this, the administrative. I mean, there are certain school districts in this state that have got two or three administrative overhead people to teachers. I mean, in smaller districts, it's like, how many counselors or secretaries do you need compared to the number of teachers in the classroom? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I've looked at this my my school years. I really loved public school certainly really well. Uh, and that's that's one of the things that feels odd about this profession to me is that I am not one of these people who was homeschooled and now is a champion for school choice. I just saw so many of my friends not get what they need from schools. Uh, and that that was just really, really heartbreaking to see like these outcomes are not not happening for a lot of kids. Um, and, and that's that's one of the reasons I, I like talking about this and seeing the numbers because the numbers really paint the picture. Yeah, no. And again, having your it's like you said, I, and I, I'm glad you said that because, you know, we do see that sometimes from some of these talking heads and, and people in education, mm -hmm. especially in the choice arena where they're like, well, of course you want choice. You came from a, a homeschool environment and you want yeah. it. And Sarah's like, no, no, I was down there brick and mortar with the stoners out back. She wasn't. <laughs> I was not. <laughs> But you know, she was there. She saw the public school. She's a she's a product of it. And yet she still goes, maybe we should. And, you know, we all saw that. I think if we all look back at our educational, uh, even uh, going back into the Wayback Machine for me uh, mm -hmm. and remembering some of those kids who just they just didn't get it. They just didn't you know, they needed that extra help. They knew all mm -hmm. those things. It's a it's a it's a tough situation. And if we don't have some kind of accountability then I guess we'll just be right back here in another two years asking for more, right? Because that last round of funding wasn't just wasn't enough at that point. Yeah, I mean, there's a reason I'm not a politician is I don't like having all of these difficult, you know, debates and compromises in the legislature. But, you know, one time funding is something that could plug the gap for now, but we will be talking about it next time. Uh, if if it's not dealt with. Um, and then this is, first of all, not an issue specific to Alaska. Districts around the country are facing this because in, in no small part, uh, COVID relief funding allowed them to kick the can down the road a little bit. Uh, and they're plugging up their labor costs with this and they're not thinking about their, you know, long-term declines in enrollment too. So uh, <laughs> we're... we're we're looking at you, Anchorage School District. Yeah, uh, you know. it's not unique. <laughs> no, it's not. And 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 that's what I mean. Again, I'm you know not a brain surgeon, nor do I play one on TV. <laughs> but I'm just thinking that if you take one-time funding and use it to pay for ongoing, reoccurring costs, you're setting yourself up for a bit of failure. There, uh, mm -hmm. it just seems like that is uh, that it seems like that's a little bit foolhardy. It does. Yeah. And we've been talking about this since these relief funds came out, uh, that it is risky to put recurring uh, recurring costs on this one-time funding. Uh, and I think that's exactly what we're seeing uh, in Alaska and nationwide. Uh, it's just we, we've districts have come to this fiscal cliff uh, and the money's running out in 2024. Yeah. So they've got to start thinking about uh, the choices they, they need to make now. Uh, and that's yeah. exactly what we're seeing. And nationally, I mean, the money could be running out soon. I mean, you know, with everything that's going on nationally from this discussion on brick and breadbasket currencies to everything else, plus the fiscal cliff and all that, the money just could be flat running out. It's not just, mm -hmm. you know, it could be it could be a tough situation. We best get a handle on it now, right? I mean, that's the thing. Um, all right. Um <laughs> That tells us we're about ready to jump back into it. Sarah Montalbano is our guest. We're going to talk a little bit first about their event, and then we'll move on to uh, and then we'll move on to discussions of uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the COVID monies. That's what it was. I I know what I'm talking about. Back with more of the Michael Duke Show, Common Sense, Liberty Based, Free Thinking Radio. Now. The Michael Duke Show. Seriously humorous with a pinch of intellect. <laughs> pinch of intellect. Sorry. That is humorous. Here's Michael Dukes. I mean, it's a pinch. 
Is that an actual finite? Is that amount? Is that really a a measurement? It's a measurement. It is a I measurement. That. It's a pinch. No more. No less. Just a pinch. Just to sweeten it up. Sarah Montalbano is our guest, uh, senior uh, uh, educa- I'm sorry, education policy analyst with the Alaska Policy Forum. Uh, and we're talking about uh, education and uh, the, the base student allocation. We're going to talk about COVID funds. But before we get to that, we're going to talk a little bit about a big event that they've got coming up this Thursday. It's a webinar. Uh, Sarah, tell us, uh, tell us what AF, uh, APF is, uh, is doing here uh, for the public and, and everything else on Thursday. Yeah, I hope all of you join me uh, Thursday, first of all, time and date. It's Thursday, April 13th, 7 p.m. Alaska time. So hopefully those of you working during the day can join us. Um, We are going to meet the attorneys from the Institute for Justice who are defending Alaska's Correspondent School Allotment Program. Uh, So a quick background in January 2023, A lawsuit was filed challenging this program um, and some concerned parents uh, with the help of this uh, public interest law firm, Institute for Justice, intervened to defend it. Um, So we've obviously heard from some parents who are concerned about the future of the program. um, And we wanted to set up this opportunity um, to sit down with the attorneys and ask your questions get your presentation uh, about the frequently asked questions. So the first half will be these uh, frequently asked questions we've heard from parents so far. Uh, And also we encourage you to bring your own questions for the uh, Q&A portion uh, to ask the attorneys about the case. I'm happy to go in a little more detail. I'm obviously not a lawyer, so I can't really comment on the intricacies of the case. But what I know is that uh, hundreds of families in Alaska are benefiting from the correspondence pro- program. In this lawsuit uh, is is threatening that. So we want you to join us. Uh, I have the registration link if you would like it. Um, and I believe Michael already shared it on uh, his page. So follow down, down into that description, get the registration link. And please, I really hope to see you. I'll be the moderator. So yeah. you can hear more from me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and you're welcome to post the link in the chat room here if you like. Uh, uh, the genesis of this whole uh, thing came from, in part, um, the uh, uh, the the circumstance of certain families in Anchorage utilizing portions of that uh, of that funding to do uh, things that were kind of out of the norm uh, for various. Um, for various uh, 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 schools and classes and things like that. But this doesn't just affect that one school. This just doesn't affect just those, those one set of families that were doing something. Because we had, um, and I'm, I'm sorry, it's the attorney general's wife, and I've totally forgotten her name here. Uh, she actually came on the program and talked to us about what they were doing with this and how they were utilizing these funds and how anybody could do this. And it would gave them basically a, 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 an opportunity to have some school children choice. Mm -hmm. Uh, That's now been challenged, but it's not just those actions. This has ramifications on like all my kids have been homeschooled. All my kids have been homeschooled. We've done it through idea. We were one of the first, I don't know, 15 or 20 families that joined idea back in the day. Uh, And we utilized, it would threaten that as well. So this is not just one action on one area or one school. This could have ramifications on, um, you know, uh, school reimbursement for Um, for distance education across the whole state. Indeed, this is my understanding as well as that this is challenging the whole program in a broad sense. Um, So this this affects, you know, all of the families that are in CSAP, who are thinking about CSAP, um, who who might want to do it in future school years. I mean, this was enacted by the legislature in 2014, and we haven't had a problem for it uh, up until now. So Please bring your questions uh, to this webinar. Wonderful, you've posted the link. Just click that, register, uh, and I'll see you on Thursday. All right, and Jess, Jody Taylor, that's who it was. Yes. Jody Taylor, I'm sorry, I, I, you know, getting old. Uh, Swiss cheese up here, that's what's that's what's going on. So Thursday, 7 p.m., you can follow the Zoom link. Uh, there's a Zoom link on here. I also have shared it to the uh, Michael Duke Show Facebook page as part of the events section there. You can see it there and uh, you can participate if you'd like to uh, be part of it. It'd be an interesting conversation. Uh, all right. Well, let's talk about the uh, other elephant in the room. And you and I were just talking about this. 
yes. during the commercial break, which is the COVID funding. Uh, obviously, the city of Kenai, who just denied that resolution for asking for more funds, one of the bones of contention was it's continuously the sky is falling. Every year there's some kind of crisis. Every year there's a shortfall. Every year we need more money. And yet we saw a just as tremendous raft of money get floated out by the federal government, especially to education systems, because obviously education was shut down and there were things that had to be done and yada, yada, yada. Uh, I mean, this is a huge deal. And now we have districts that are sitting on a tremendous amount of money. Uh, what what have you found as you look at Alaska and the different districts and the systems and how much money is out there? What have you found out about the COVID money that remains uh, in Alaska unspent and what could be done with that? So in general, we've looked, the Department of Education publishes a dashboard and they update that dashboard approximately quarterly, although they're, they're not always on time with that. Um, we have summarized uh, updates on alaskapolicyforum.org. Uh, and our most recent one was March, 2023. So very recently, um, districts received $538 million in total. Uh, and they've spent 55% now. So a majority has been spent, but 45% remains. And that 45% is about $242 million left. Um, in many of these districts, you can see we've, we publish a table with all of the districts um, and how much they have left, how much they received per student. Uh, and so many districts still have 50% or more remaining. Uh, this The end of the funding uh, I believe it expires in September 2024, something like that. Uh, so they'll have it through this upcoming school year. Uh, so that is part of the going to be part of their budget discussions um, in the spring when they start to uh, finalize the budget for the 2023-2024 school year. And I mean, this is not an insignificant amount of money for some districts. I mean, it. I mean, even if they have forty-five or fifty percent of that money's left, and yet they come to us. And again, this is short-term, finite amounts of funding. They could use it on a one-term basis to help bolster programs and things like that. But instead, we've seen many of these districts tackle reoccurring costs with one-time funding bonuses and and then put themselves in an even deeper position. As you said earlier, this gives them the opportunity to kick the can down the road. And, and that is problematic. I mean, but you've got some districts out there with tens of millions of dollars still sitting there, right? Yes, yes. And uh, one of the things nationwide, I was looking at a very interesting article this morning from the Edunomics Lab at Georgetown University, and they did a kind of nationwide uh, survey of this thing. And they found that half of relief funds are paying for labor. Um, there's 22 states that do provide some detail on what was purchased, um, and that was just under 50%. Um, so they're, you know, talking about continuity of operations and things like that. They're using this to, you know, keep staff on. And they're not thinking about this perhaps permanent decline in enrollment in a lot of districts. A lot of districts are seeing this and they're not pairing back their staff yet um, to, to think about that. And we have to remember that staff is the biggest part of so many of these district's cost, whether you're talking about teachers or administrators, it's all staff, they all get salaries and benefits, and that's a huge right. component of, of funding. Um, so, you know, we're paying for recurrent budget items. Um, it's a really fantastic way to avoid thinking about these annual efforts that districts usually do to rein in these escalating costs or right-sizing their operating budgets. Um, usually they would be having hard conversations every spring about it, but now they're seeing the end of this cliff and going, oh gosh, we have so many positions. It's going to be, you know, layoffs. It's going to be, you know, a really scary time if we don't find extra sources of funding for this. Well, and as you said, I think the thing that nobody seems to really is they're treating this as if it's a one time spike in student enrollment decline, when in mm -hmm. much, many cases it's a continual. I mean, no, this is an ongoing thing, especially in Alaska post COVID. We saw a significant increase in homeschooling and other correspondence type schools, and that's going to take that money straight out of the district. Less than 60 seconds. I'll give you the final word there. Yeah, I would just say that, you know, we've been watching this since it was started um, and we're seeing a lot of the consequences now. Uh, districts need to be having these hard conversations. 
Uh, my last plug for you is that if you know a young person or you are a young person yourself, please consider our internship program. We're re recruiting for summer 2023. Uh, I had a great time uh, and I, I hope uh, to see some applications. Because that's where you came from. You were an intern. It is. Right, exactly. Sarah Montalbano from the Alaska Policy Forum. Thanks for coming on and joining us, folks. We are out of time for this hour. Coming up next, James Bartlett, author, right here on The Michael Duke Show. I wish we'd had more time to get into that idea, Sarah. And this is, you know, one of those things that kind of just happens organically during our mm -hmm. conversations. I wish we'd had more time to get into that discussion about enrollment decline and what is what is the new number? Because I think many administrators in their arrogance think, oh, well, that's just a COVID thing and it'll come back. But I think that there's a I think that there's a big change. I think that there's a fundamental shift going on. Uh, whether it's a paradigm shift or dichotomy shift, whatever you want to call it, mm -hmm. in how education is done. And we're going to see that enrollment, a good portion of that could be permanent. Yeah, I was going to say, I've actually got one number off the top of my head. Uh, correspondent school enrollment spiked to about 92% higher, almost doubled uh, from its pre-pandemic. And now it is still 42% elevated. So a lot of the people that tried this are sticking with it. Um, so that's, you know, a permanent enrollment shift we've seen. So they had almost a hundred percent increase and now mm -hmm. they're finding that almost half of them are going to stick with it afterwards. That's yep. huge. I mean, that is yes. a huge, huge number. And, uh, uh, and I think that it, it you know, at, uh, we, it, we, we discount that at our peril, I think. And mm -hmm. I think school administrators discount that at their peril as well. So absolutely. Well, uh, it's always good to see you. Uh, you're going to be hosting the uh, webinar on Thursday. You're going to be the I moderator. Am. All right. Well, I am. Good for yeah. you. Look, coming up. It's going to be a late night. Pretty soon you're going to be hosting your own radio show. That's how it's going to work. Around, right? <laughs> be I'd be time. delighted, but I don't want to. Yeah. Not I yet. <laughs> I can't take the competition, so it's fine. <laughs> So Sarah, Mont Mont Sarah Montalbano, I guess. Thank you, Sarah, for coming on board. It's good to talk with you. We will talk with you again uh, soon. Thank you very much. Talk soon. All right. Thanks for coming on board.